Okay, well, hi everyone. Thank you for coming here today to see my talk. Um, hopefully you can't see my presenter notes um, and you're actually looking at the, the slide. So let's get started. Dynamic navigation in modularized apps. This is my talk with some very big words, but I will explain why I picked these words in a little bit. So if you don't know me, my name is Sumaya Ahmed. I am currently an Android engineer at large. Um, I have about eight years of experience building Android apps. Um, and I was most recently a senior engineer at Comcast where we had our own very large modularized application. So let's do a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, this talk is going to be about 30 minutes long. So that gives us plenty of time for questions and also hopefully lunch or a snack before the next session. So let's start talking about it. Why am I talking about modularization? Because that in itself is a really huge topic and navigation components itself is also a huge topic. But I'm focusing on the interesting things that happen when you put them both together because most of the time these days, we have really large apps. So chances are, if you're a working Android professional these days, your application has got you know, hundreds of thousands of users, if not millions. And at that point, you are looking at multiple feature sets. You are probably servicing different kinds of users. And each of these users has their own experiences and their own navigation flows. You've got multiple features. At that point, a monolithic code base doesn't really cut it. And you have to modularize. And a lot of apps, a lot of companies have been through this process and it's become um, kind of a standard in Android these days. So the question arises, how do you use navigation components when your architecture looks like this? This is something that we went through at Comcast um, and I'm guessing it's very common because modularization as a paradigm sort of came about before navigation components became a thing. So it's very likely that when you're getting started with navigation components, you already have some sort of modularized architecture and you sort of have to adapt navigation components on top of this. So we'll talk about that. How exactly does modularization make navigation components complicated? What are the problems that you can run into? And we'll talk about how we solve those problems. So we have a compile time solution and a runtime solution. And as always, we want to make sure that users see a cohesive experience because the user doesn't know that everything in our application is very well architected and encapsulated and uh, all that stuff. To them, the app has to behave like a monolithic app. They expect to go through that app and it's going to remember where they've been and what they've been doing and sort of the data trail they've been leaving. So we'll also talk about how to make that happen with navigation components. Um, and one more thing, I am assuming that you do know a little bit about navigation components and modularization because this is an advanced talk. You don't have to be an expert in both of these topics by any means, but it would be really helpful to know what is a navigation graph and how do you do basic navigation with a controller and also what does typical, um, what's a typical modularized Android app look like? Uh, if you don't, please stick around. It's still fun to listen. Uh, so let's get started. How exactly does modularization make navigation complicated? Like it, supposedly it's easy. What are the things that can go wrong? Well, to answer that question, we are gonna start way at the beginning. At its core, navigation is about getting from point A to point B. In mobile app world, where that means getting from screen A to screen B somehow. So in the old days, uh, or in the fairly recent days, if you're an Android developer, you do this with intents. So if A and B are activities, you transition with intents. Um, if A and B are fragments, you would use fragment transactions. Now, of course, uh, we have navigation components. So all that work that we used to have to do manually, adding fragments to a stack, removing fragments from a stack, uh, managing transition animations, uh, all that stuff gets delegated to the single overloaded function called navigate. Uh, the library just says, as long as you have your destinations predefined in your graph XML, then once your activity inflates this graph, all the fragments can just paste in this line of code to navigate wherever. And all you need is this ID of your destination somewhere else in the graph. 
So the navigation logic we got to write got a lot simpler. Like if you remember, um, we usually have activities with multiple fragments and then your activity just ends up having a ton of logic around managing these fragments and making uh, the navigation logic happen. So all that cruft gets removed. However, this means we are making a big assumption. We're assuming that B is discoverable from A. We're assuming that A and B exist in the same scope. And in nav components world, that means we're assuming A and B exist in the same graph. And I mean, that's obvious. That's what allows the nav controller to find B when you're in A. But what about this case? What if your structure looks like this? What if A and B exist in different scopes? How does A know about B? I mean, the developer knows, knows about it, but the graph containing A knows nothing about the graph containing B. Uh, and that's by design. Graphs don't know about each other's contents. They're encapsulated. Because typically, you only navigate within a navigation graph. That's what nav components wants you to do. You sort of predefine your destinations, and they're all supposed to be related to a single feature, and you get around within this graph. But what about the case when you have to navigate across graphs? That's when your scoping sort of makes this difficult. And that problem gets compounded when you have a modularized app. So if you see here, this is a diagram of a very simplified, typical modularized structure. You have your host app layer, and this is sort of like your core functionality of your application. This is what gets launched when the user hits the app icon. So it probably handles authentication and your data persistence and all that stuff. And all of your feature sets are neatly encapsulated into either Gradle modules or internal libraries that are dependencies for the host app. Uh, by the way, in this talk, Gradle modules and internal libraries are really the same thing. They're just packaged code that you wrote that you sort of pulled into a separate package because you wanted that encapsulation and maintainability. And each of these libraries has its own activities with their own navigation graphs and their own logic, all that stuff. And this is the typical, this is your recommended architecture for modularization. But the problem is none of these things know about each other's navigation graphs. So how do you manage something like this when you want to get from the host app to a feature in library A and then from there to a feature in library B? How can we use the nav components library to get between these things that don't know about each other? Uh, and these are the problems that we encountered at Comcast. When we're using navigation components, the sort of built-in scoping at the graph layer makes it difficult. And then you have the additional problem that you're sometimes you're navigating across libraries and these internal libraries are in different code bases uh, with no immediate access to each other's code. Well, if you're thinking, I mean, isn't it just a case of, you know, launching another activity? So let's say you're in the host app with your host activity and you want to launch a feature activity. Can't you just do that the way we've always done? Can't we call start activity and let feature activity inflate, you know, um, act activate, inflate its own nav graph, let its navigation take over? Basically, we can just do a handoff. Uh, and that's typically what happens. But what if you can't do a handoff? What if instead of launching a feature and just letting that blindly take over, you want to get to a point within that feature's navigation graph? Let's say you want to get to fragment B and you don't know where it is in the flow. You don't know anything about the setup of the graph. You just know that there is a view in there that you want to reach. It's a specific view, you want fragment B and you can't hit the start destination. You can't just let the graph take over because that's not the flow that you want. Say for example, fragment A is some onboarding experience that doesn't apply to this user, or you just want a deep link. And that's why I call this type of navigation dynamic. You're not using graphs the way they're sort of meant to be used. You're not using your statically defined XML directly you're putting together a navigation flow from one feature to another that's custom to the user's experience. And that brings us to the two types of problems that we had to deal with. So first problem is navigating between libraries with, with known destinations. That's our fragment B case. 
And the second type of problem is navigating between libraries with unknown destinations. And that's where you really don't know where to go. And that's a little bit weirder of a use case. We'll talk about that one later. But let's tackle the first problem. How do we get from one graph to somewhere in another graph? We don't know anything about it, just that there is a view in there that we want. And this sounds like an impossible situation, but we are just talking about deep links. So luckily for us, the NAV components library allows us to create deep links. Uh, that's even across graphs. And that works even across, let's say, different code bases, which otherwise wouldn't know about each other's contents. So what does this look like with NAV components? Let's, let's go through this in code step by step. First thing is we'll look at the destination, your deep link. This is the fragment you want to get to via deep link. And in our example, that's called fragment B. It lives in the library. It belongs in the library's navigation graph, which is called library nav. And as you can see from the code here, this is all XML. This is your library nav XML. And we've declared fragment B as one of our destinations. Uh, and the solution is actually right there in front of you. We all we have to do is assign a deep link attribute to this destination. The same way that we would assign an action or an arguments attribute, we're gonna assign it a deep link attribute that comes out of the box with nav components. And really the important field here is the app URI field. In this case, I've called it Samaya app slash fragment B. It just has to be unique to that destination. And this tells the parent graph to keep track of this deep link and it also makes it findable from outside of this parent graph. And that's really all we have to do on the destination side. We just make it deep linkable. So let's change our attention over to the source, the color of this deep link, which in our example is sort of like your host application, uh, your main code base. So it has to know about your library somehow. So we make sure there's a build time dependency there in our build Gradle file. And what we want to do is we want to call this deep link from somewhere in our source graph, which is main nav, let's say. So main nav has a bunch of fragments and we're in main nav somewhere. Let's say we're in fragment A um, and we want to get to fragment B. So can we just add fragment B as a destination directly within main nav? Well, we can't because fragment B belongs to library nav and library nav's contents are hidden from main nav. So how do we actually put these destinations together? Well, what we can do, instead of adding fragment B directly as a destination within main nav, what we're gonna do is we are going to put the entire destination graph inside main nav. And I'll talk about why this works in a minute. But as you can see here, this is exactly like nesting layouts where we can nest graphs. So we use the same include tag that we use with nested layouts, and we are referencing the library nav graph with its ID. So we've declared a deep link destination. Um, we have made sure that there is a compile time dependency between these two code bases, and we have nested our destination graph inside our source graph. So really the last step that we need to do is actually do the navigation, like kick off the deep link. Uh, with our code. And we normally do this by calling the navigate function with the ID of the fragment we want. So in this case, can we just call navigate with r.id.fragmentb? Well, again, no, we can't. Even though library nav is nested within main nav, encapsulation is still maintained. The main nav still has no idea about the contents of library nav. So it still doesn't know the exact ID of the fragment we want. Luckily for us, there is another way of getting around this. So instead of using IDs, we use a class called deep link, nav deep link request. Uh, and it's very simple, very basic. As you can see here, it's accessible via a builder and it's essentially just a wrapper around the URI. It's the same URI we defined earlier. And we pass our nav deep link request, the URI that we want. And that becomes the parameter for our navigate function. So this sort of gets you around the problem of navigating to certain points between graphs that don't know about each other. But really, how does, it, how does this work? Because all we know is that we just nest these graphs and somehow 
they're able to communicate via this URI. So the answer to that lies in how the function navigate works behind the scenes and what's really in the nav destination class. So we're gonna do a very quick but deep dive into how nav components really works behind the scenes. And we'll see that it's not as strange as it seems. Remember that your nav graph is all of your destinations that you can get to. And the XML that we write gets turned into an object owned by the nav controller. The nav controller is just responsible for identifying the right destination and putting it onto and perhaps off the back stack. There is also a third component in the nav components library. It's called the nav host. We are not going to talk about it because it really doesn't matter for this talk. Every time the nav controller, uh, I mean, basically the nav controller is going to have an instance of your nav graph. It's going to have an object representation of your XML that you wrote. And that nav graph class is going to have an array of type nav destination. And what is that exactly? That's just a one-to-one -one mapping of the destinations that we wrote in our XML, which could be fragments or activities or nested graphs as we just saw. But basically at runtime, there's a class called nav inflator and it will iterate through the XML and for each destination, it's going to wrap it in a nav destination and add it to the array. So that lets your nav controller not care about what type of destination it is. The nav destination class abstracts away all the type specific navigation. So the nav controller just has to identify the right one and then say, okay, I found you, just navigate to yourself. And how exactly does that work? Well, once the inflator is done parsing the XML, each nav destination is going to look something like this. It's gonna have some information from the XML that we wrote, and it's gonna create some other stuff behind the scenes. So it's going to have the class type, um, it's gonna have actions, arguments, deep links, all the stuff that we wrote is gonna get put into your nav destination object. And in addition, it's going to have an instance of a navigator. Now the navigator class is, is a type specific implementation of an abstract class. And the navigator's job is to actually do type specific navigation. So a navigator for fragments is gonna use fragment transaction. Navigators for type activities use intents. So as you can see, we're not really reinventing the way Android does uh, navigation. If you go and look at the navigator class source code, you're going to see all the code that we used to write manually, like uh, adding fragments to a stack, uh, using fragment transaction and committing it to the back stack or launching activities with intents. Uh, it's all the same, it's all there. It's just abstracted away and behind a bunch of layers in this library, so we don't have to care about it. So let's put all of this together. Why does this work? Well, when we nest library nav within main nav, we're actually making it a nav destination. And it's going to have a navigator of type nav graph. And that knows how to get around within that internal nav graph. So at the main nav level, our source graph, remember, this is where we are actually calling this deep link. Uh, when we say find nav controller navigate with a deep link request, um, it, it's going to go through four steps. First, it's going to iterate through its array of nav destinations looking for a deep link match. Remember, it, has, it doesn't have an ID, it has a handle on that URI. So once it gets to this nav destination, this particular nav destination with, knows about its own deep links. It's one of the properties of the nav graph class. So it's gonna throw up a match. So your parent nav controller says, great, we found the right one. I'm gonna delegate navigation to you. And that navigator, has a handle on the URI it should look for. So it's gonna search through the internal nav graphs, deep links, match it up, and that brick gets it to fragment B. And then it can add fragment B to the stack, which is launching that fragment and effectively just doing the deep link. So it seems like there was a lot going on behind the scenes and there is, but what I was hoping to demonstrate that it's actually quite a simple process to do this deep link. Uh, 
I mean, when you're just writing code, it's very easy for a developer to put this together while maintaining encapsulation and while maintaining best practices. Um, as you can see, I didn't have to change any of my other architecture. We can still use deep links to create navigation across libraries and across graphs. So hooray, we've solved our first problem. That doesn't solve everything though. Um, how, how do we make sure users always see a cohesive flow? Um, and if you're wondering if that's even a problem, consider this case. This is something that we ran into. Imagine your stack looks like this. You have fragment A from the host app and then fragment uh, C from the host app. And then you have a deep linked fragment on top from another code base, let's say an internal library that you wrote. So fragment C doesn't know about fragment D until runtime. How do fragments in the stack react to this destination that's unknown? What if fragment C needs to know what happens in fragment D? For example, let's say um, fragment D is some new onboarding experience and fragment C needs to know, has the user seen this new onboarding experience or not? Well, they don't share a view model. They don't share an activity or a data store or anything. Basically, the only thing they have in common is the backstack. So we're asking, how can we share data across a backstack between fragment C and fragment D? There are a couple of ways that the nav components library let us sort of do this data sharing. The recommended way is to use nav graph view models. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a way of scoping a view model, not to a fragment or an activity, which is very typical, but to a nav graph. So as you can see here, it really just takes a line of code. What I've done is I've declared an instance of main graph view model. That's a class that I wrote. That's a view model I wrote. So I'm creating an instance of it. And the second half of this line actually does the scoping. I use the delegate by nav graph view models and pass it the parameter, which in this case is main nav. It's an ID of the graph I want to scope it to. And this tells the library, this instance of main graph view model is going to be alive as long as main nav is alive. And not only that, it's accessible to all the destinations within main nav. So whatever fragments or activities are defined as destinations within main nav, they can paste in this line of code and get access to the single shared graph level view model instance, which is great. This gives us a way of doing graph level business logic, graph level memory, persistence, uh, all that stuff. But does that really work in our case? Remember that fragment C and fragment D come from different code bases. They belong to different navigation graphs. So using NAF graph view models isn't really going to help us in this case. Luckily, we were able to find another workaround for this, and that's by using saved state handle. Now, if you're not familiar with saved state handle, it's basically, it's a fancy saved instance state. Um, it's part of the Android architecture components library, and that lets you get a handle on your saved instance state. In this case, it's a saved state handle through your view model. And it's, uh, it's, What's really interesting is that the nav components library gives you a saved state handle, not through a view model or another lifecycle owner, but you get a saved state handle as part of your nav destination, which opens up a lot of possibilities. Let's take a look. Every time your nav controller adds something to the stack, it wraps it in another class called nav backstack entry. And the nav backstack entry is just giving your nav destination some extra stuff. Uh, so let's say your destination in this case is a fragment. This fragment is going to have access to a view model store, which we don't care about right now, but it will have access to a saved state handle as long as it's on the stack. So you can treat it like a saved instant state. You can read data, write data, persist, uh, persist very data, anything that you could put in a saved state handle um, like primitives or parcelable objects, uh, you have access to this data repository and it's guaranteed to survive rotation and process death. Not only that, but the navigation controller class exposes functions to let you access other entries on the stack along with their properties, including their saved state handles. 
So putting this all together, let's see how it helps us with our problem. Again, our, our stack is fragment A and then fragment C. And fragment C needs to know, has the user seen a new onboarding experience? So it can ask it, whoops, it can ask its nav controller for the current backstack entry, which is itself, get its own saved state handle, and set some high-level Boolean value to false. We'll call that value has seen new onboarding flow. So now let's say we perform our deep link and fragment D is our new onboarding experience. Voila, the user has seen it. So fragment D can ask its nav controller to get the previous backstack entry, which is fragment C, get its saved state handle and set that flag to true. And this works because even though fragment C and fragment D have are referencing different nav controllers, they're still working on the same shared application backstack. Uh, I mean, unless, of course, you open things in a new stack or a new task, but that's a complication we are not going to talk about today. So we have updated fragment C's value to, to let it know that the user has seen what you want it to see. Now let's pop off this deep length fragment from the stack. Fragment C comes back in on resume, and it can access, again, the current backstack entry, get the saved state handle, and get them that most updated value for the flag, and react to it. Again, this is what makes it dynamic. You're using the properties of the nav components library to build an in-app memory of where the user has been and what they've been doing, which is pretty powerful if you think about it. And I mean, this is not a perfect solution. Um, what we found is that there's a lot of things that we're making assumptions about. We're assuming that everybody has agreed that we're going to save data in this format um, and we're using this parameter name. It's very breakable. Imagine if a developer goes in and changes a parameter in one code base but forgets to update it in another code base. Or we change our navigation logic so that, and now what you thought was your previous backstack entry is just another fragment entirely. So there's a lot of ways that you could mess things up and get runtime problems. But, and it's a little bit hacky, yes. But these situations arise when you have a particular set of constraints. And the use cases we're talking about right now um, do present these really unique, weird situations. And the library isn't fully capable of getting around that. So yes, we can absolutely share data across the backstack between these things that belong to completely different um, navigation graphs. And you can totally make that happen, uh, you know, sort of like in a runtime level in-app memory, which is not perfect, but it works. Phew. So we spent a lot of time talking about the first use case. But what if you don't know where to go until runtime? What if you're sort of traversing through your navigation flow um, and you don't know where you're going next? And if you're thinking, how is this possible? We, again, we ran into this. It's possible to not know where you need to go until runtime. For example, let's say that your stack is again, fragment A and then fragment C, and your next step is some view that belongs to an external library. So you don't have any control over that code base. You just know that at some point you are at runtime, uh, you are going to get your next fragment via callback. Uh, and you're in a navigation graph and you have to sort of get to it. And somewhere between fragment C and fragment E, you have to figure out navigation. Uh, and you have to stay within this graph because you can't hand things off to this external library. You don't have control over it. Maybe your contract doesn't work that way. So how do we, how do we make this happen? Uh, we, we can't put it into our graph XML because we don't know what it is yet. But luckily for us, you can mutate your graph at runtime, even though you're, it seems like you have to predefine everything in a static XML file, graphs are mutable. And in this case, you can add nav destinations at runtime. So let's see how this works in code. How would you code this up? Now let's assume that you're in fragment C and you want to get to your next, you are responsible for launching that next view. Uh, and let's say this is your callback. Navigate to destination is your callback. And 
your library is passing you the next fragment. We'll call it destination fragment class. All right, you've got it. You've got your next fragment. But we can't just plop that into our code because we're in a nav graph and we're using nav controllers and they use nav destinations. So let's create one. You can actually ask the nav controller to get a particular navigator. In this case, it's a fragment navigator because we're working with fragments. And that exposes a function called create destination. All it needs is an ID and a label. And as you can see, we've just generated random ones here. And of course, the class that you've got because it has to know what to inflate. Uh, great, we've got a destination. Now let's make it navigable. And we can do that by just simply calling navcontroller.graph.addDestination with itself. So now that becomes that particular destination becomes findable and navigable from everywhere else within this graph. And that means pretty much the last step is to call navigate with that ID that we defined earlier. And how exactly does this work? Well, not knowing what's in fragment D doesn't really matter. We don't have any control over fragment D, but we don't care because what we really care about is navigating to it from within a graph environment. And to make that happen, we just need to create this sort of shell nav destination. And the nav destination just has to know, what do I host? So we can do that, we can make that happen. We create a destination, we pass it the class name and the ID, and we can insert it into the correct position within our graph. And again, this is really powerful. This makes our graphs dynamic. We are stitching together navigation logic on the fly, customized to our user experience. So even though we assume that navigation graphs have to be static, that you have to predefine all the destinations you can get to. You have to predefine all the paths that you can take. Real life isn't always like that. In real life, you have to deal with unknowns and modules and modularization creates a lot of unknowns. You have to deal with scoping. You have to deal with how much you can predetermine at compile time and how much you know at runtime. When we design things to be encapsulated and independent, the points where these interact create a lot of unknowns. But what I'm hoping that this talk helped understand is that navigation components is new and it's still evolving, but it's really powerful. It's completely possible to have a modularized architecture and easily use navigation components to deal with these unknowns. And not only that, uh, we don't have to change our architecture to do it. We don't have to do a massive refactor. We don't have to deal with, we don't have to change our logic at all. It's completely possible to use this really powerful tool uh, with its own quirks and complexities, but we can still deal with um, compile time deep linking. We can still deal with unknowns at the runtime, uh, at runtime and unknowns at compile time. So I hope you have as much fun as I did uh, using this tool as I did talking about it. Thank you so much for sitting through this talk. Thank you to John and Victoria for an amazing conference. And I am just about ready for questions. We have plenty of time. Yes, we do. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, learned so much from it. I remember I was running into those exact things last time I played around with navigation components. So thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, if you have questions, uh, head over to Slack, go to the Dynamic Navigation in Modularize Apps channel and drop your questions there. We already have a couple, so we can jump right into talking about those. Um, to start, let's start with the question, how's the performance or memory or timing of deep links versus regular navigation with the back, back stack? And are there trade-offs? That's, that's a great question. And this is one of those things that I honestly have to say, I don't know, because uh, it's, uh, it's one of those cases like deep linking across graphs is sort of an edge case and we haven't used it extensively. What I can say is that there hasn't been a noticeable difference when using the application. Um, we don't see any weird behavior with screens lagging while the, the app tries to figure out what's going on. So 
while you're using the app, there is no time lag. There's no visible time lag. It's possible that if you sort of measure it in your memory analyzer, you may get a few milliseconds of delay. Who knows? But uh, it, it works and it hasn't been a performance issue for us. Uh, another question, did you try UI testing with your nav graphs? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the honest question is, uh, navigation graphs and UI testing is something very new personally to me. Um, and that's not something that I have worked with. So I'm, I'm honestly going to talk about all the stuff that I don't know. Um, I am by no means a nav components expert or a testing expert. I know that it can be done and we have engineers working on it. Um, but I have not worked with it so far. What I do know is that there is developer documentation on it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I think I've looked at the documentation a little bit and mm -hmm. it is helpful. Um, another question is, have you looked at A-B testing at all with maybe different navigation or different data set? We have. Uh, I'm assuming that you're talking about uh, like, as, as I mentioned, dynamic navigation. So having sort of runtime, half the user is going to path A and half the user is going path B. Um, we haven't done formal A-B testing like this. What we have done is, yes, some of our users are in a sort of unique use case. So we send them down a particular path at runtime. And that's exactly how we came about and dealt with these problems. Like we realized, hey, these users are gonna go into a new flow that's not typical. Um, how do we pass data to that new flow? Mm -hmm. uh, all right, this is kind of a similar question around testing. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. If not, we have um, another question to hop to after this. Is Do you know if there's a way to isolate your navigation to test with like unit testing if you've tried it before? Um, that That is a great question. Uh, we haven't, I haven't done this personally. What I have done, I do know that there is a way to isolate your navigation logic behind a navigation presenter or a navigation manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just a class. So instead of having your navigation logic being handled by your fragment or your activity, which makes it much more difficult to test, you can actually pull out your navigation logic into a manager class and let that manager, it's become your sort of router basically. So if you've used MVI or Redux architecture, um, that's it's probably going to be a very familiar concept to you. You have something like a reducer um, and this navigation manager becomes like a reducer class. Um, and that class is just pure business logic and it becomes very easy to test. So I hope that helps. Yeah, that's really great. Um, all right. And then let's do one more question. This is one that uh, Josh answered in Slack, but it'd be great to discuss it on video for anyone watching the recording. Um, can we use nav deep link requests simply without using include for layout nav in XML? The answer is yes. So uh, you can use that nav deep link request within navigation graphs, of course. So if you sort of like want to deep link to a particular subgraph or whatever you've defined in your XML, the nav deep link request class is there for whatever purpose you want it. In this particular use case, we're sort of nesting graphs because we need to have access to that graph as a destination to perform that deep link and we don't have access to it otherwise. Mm -hmm.